Hi, I'm Matt, and welcome to Tech Tested. Today we're going to be doing a showdown between two of the most iconic platforms in PC history, LGA 1366 and AM3+. Now the first question you may be asking yourself is, why are we comparing these two specific platforms? As you may recall in one of our previous videos where I did a build off with two other channels, I had to choose between AM3 Plus or LGA 1366. During my challenge, I decided to go with LGA 1366, and after doing overclocking on the i7-950 that I chose, I realized that the Cinebench scores were quite close to what I was accustomed to seeing on the AM3 Plus platform. So I decided that it was a good time to see how each of them hold up in today's titles and how, more specifically, they compare to each other. That result made me decide I needed to figure out if I actually chose the right platform going with LGA 1366 over AM3+. When LGA 1366 and the X58 chipset launched, it helped solidify Intel's dominance in the CPU market on the heels of their Core 2 series. The i7-920 that launched with that system was heralded as the best value CPU you could get if you wanted to get into high-end PC gaming. And the i7-950 that we ran in our benchmarks is just a later iteration of that same CPU. Some of the great features of the X58 platform were native SLI support along with triple channel memory which up to that point had not been seen in consumer products. It also saw the launch of the very first consumer grade six core CPU for the high-end desktop. Even today, Chinese companies are harvesting the chipsets in order to create cheap motherboards that you can drop one of these i7s or even more popularly now, the cheaper Xeons in. Moving on to the AMD platform, we see a stark contrast in reception. When the AM3 Plus platform launched, along with the release of the AMD FX lineup in the bulldozer architecture, people were hoping it would be AMD's return to high-end desktop computing. Unfortunately, due to Windows scheduling and AMD's architecture, which forced two of the cores to share a floating point unit, performance was lackluster at best and saw very poor reception from the public. Fortunately, with an update in Windows scheduling and the release of the Vishera architecture, AMD saw a significant performance increase. But by then, Ivy Bridge had been released and AMD was struggling to keep up in single-threaded and multi-threaded tasks at the same price point. With the FX processors, AMD sacrificed single core performance, falling even behind their outgoing Phenom 2 lineup in favor of higher clock speeds. Unfortunately, that increased power consumption and it didn't result in the gains that they were hoping for. Having said that, the overclocking potential of these AMD FX processors is amazing and it still holds the records for the highest clock speed ever recorded. And with that, let's get into the specs of our showdown. We pitted my i7-950 that I was able to get to 3.9 gigahertz up against an FX8320 that I was able to overclock to 4.5 gigahertz. Both of these processors were water-cooled and had plenty of thermal headroom, and I could have gone further with each of them, but I figured I might as well stop with what could be an achievable overclock for most people. The i7 was overclocked on a Gigabyte X58 USB 3 motherboard with 24 gigabytes of DDR3 1600 megahertz RAM. And in our stock configuration, we ran it at 1600 megahertz. Unfortunately, when we overclocked the CPU, we had to drop our RAM frequency down to 1320 megahertz. Our AMD processor ran with 16 gigabytes of DDR3 memory at 1600 megahertz, both at stock and overclock speeds. Now before you say it, neither of these CPUs were hampered by a lack of memory and neither of them saw all 16 gigabytes or 24 gigabytes utilized during our benchmarks. Both of these systems were powered by a thousand watt power supply and the GPU we ran in these systems was my 5700 XT reference design. And we ran all of our benchmarks at low settings at 1080p in order to eliminate any GPU bottleneck we might run into. One more thing before we get to the benchmarks. A lot of my i7 results look the same at stock and overclocked frequencies, and I re-ran these benchmarks multiple times, even at lower resolutions, in order to try to eliminate any other bottlenecks that might be in the system that might be causing this problem. I was not able to identify why we had such similar results with stock clocks and overclocks, but I do intend to investigate that in the future. Just go in knowing that I am aware that there seems to be an issue with this. I do intend to resolve it, but these are the results after running the benchmarks many, many times trying to validate them. And without further ado, let's get into the benchmarks. 
In Cinebench R15, you can see both of our processors definitely benefited from their overclocks, but the i7 takes the cake in all but the overclocked multi-threaded score from the FX8320. In Cinebench R20, we see pretty much the same story as we saw in Cinebench R15. In heaven, both systems definitely benefited from the overclock, but even the stock i7 took down the mighty FX8320 even when it was overclocked. Time Spy is where things get kind of confusing. The stock i7 outperformed the overclocked i7 and the stock 8320. However, we do see a win from the FX8320 after it's been overclocked. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the i7 performs basically the same overclocked and at stock, getting within the margin of error from run to run. However, even that takes down the FX8350 overclocked to 4.5 GHz. Far Cry 5 sees much of the same story as Shadow of the Tomb Raider, showing that this FX8320 can't really compete with the i7 in modern titles. Now for the next two benchmarks, I decided to go with real-time strategy games since they are notoriously capable of crushing CPUs. And we see that play out very well here. In Age of Empires 2 in the CAN benchmark, we saw the i7 perform basically same overclocked and stocked. Again, yes, I'm aware there's a problem here, I just haven't been able to identify it yet. But even then, they still take down the overclocked FX8320. And the trend continues in Ashes of the Singularity. While in both of the real-time strategy game titles, the FX8320 definitely benefits from the overclock, they still can't compete with the i7-950. As we can see from these results, the i7-950 takes down the FX8320 quite handily, making the X58 platform our platform of choice in this matchup. The fact that you could get a six core Xeon to drop into an X58 platform also adds insult to injury against our FX lineup. So if you wanted to pick up a cheap six core Xeon and motherboard from AliExpress, that would definitely be the superior way to go versus picking up a second hand AMD FX platform. So is there any value to be had in the AMD FX platform? The only thing I can recommend is if you have not dabbled in overclocking and you want to get into it, this would be a great platform to start with. This is what I learned to overclock on, and these FX chips are very forgiving. So in conclusion, the i7 clearly took the lead here, and the LJ1366 platform can still punch quite above its weight class. The AM3 Plus platform, however, has not aged as well as many of us would have hoped. As always, thanks for watching. If you liked our content, don't forget to hit like and subscribe, follow us on our social media platforms, check out our Discord and our website so you can pick yourself up some tech-tested merch.